Astronomers studying Betelgeuse suggest it's much more evolved than previously thought and will explode in a supernova any century or possibly any decade now. That's the finding by a team led by Dr. Hadiyuki Sayo and collaborators. They determined that Betelgeuse may be reaching the end of carbon burning in its core. Now that's remarkable, considering that most astronomers think Betelgeuse is still undergoing helium fusion in its core, and therefore shouldn't supernova for at least another 100,000 years or so. However, Sayo's paper has not been peer-reviewed. Normally, I wouldn't talk about an unpublished paper, but it was uploaded to the archive preprint server and it went viral from there. And that led another team of astronomers to publish a rebuttal, even though Sayo's paper hasn't been published yet. So there's a lot to unpack here, from how Sayo's team arrived at their controversial conclusion, to the criticism, and to some other really strange things about Betelgeuse that neither side appears to be addressing. Let's start with a little bit of background. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star in the northeast shoulder of Orion. It probably started off life as a very hot 19 or 20 solar mass star. Massive stars like Betelgeuse evolve rapidly because they burn through their fuel much hotter than the sun does. As a result, it consumes that fuel much faster. So while our sun might spend its first 10 billion years of its life fusing hydrogen into helium, Betelgeuse fused its core hydrogen in less than 10 million years. With each stage of the star's evolution, the core gets hotter and fuses faster. So Betelgeuse should fuse its helium core into carbon in just 100,000 years. Carbon is fused into neon in a couple of centuries. Neon fuses into oxygen in a few decades. Oxygen is fused into silicon in a couple of months. And silicon fuses into iron in about one day. When the core becomes iron, it ceases to produce energy and collapses. The star's interior implodes and rebounds in a supernova explosion. It's never a question of if Betelgeuse will go supernova, but when. The problem is we can't actually look inside to see what's going on in the core. But Betelgeuse is a pulsating variable star, and we have reliable light curves going back at least a century. The most dramatic example of its variability came during the Great Dimming of 2019, when it fell to about one-third its normal brightness. By the following spring, Betelgeuse had recovered. But then in 2023, Betelgeuse shone about 50% brighter than normal. The hotter the core gets, the more the star expands, and the longer it takes to pulsate. So in principle, we should be able to use the star's pulsation period and work backward to estimate its size and what must be going on in the core. But stars are complex and usually have multiple pulsations going on at once. Betelgeuse's light curve suggests it has four periods of 2200 days, 420 days, and two shorter periods of 230 and 185 days. But those periods are approximate. The star is so distended that some parts are expanding outward while other parts contract inward. So the result is an undulating mess that looks less like a star and more like an angry cloud. We can even see its shape change when we image it. And not only that, but Betelgeuse has shed anywhere from 8 to 10 solar masses worth of material as it pulsates. Most of that ejected mass has cooled into a giant cloud of dust surrounding the star. All of these problems make it very hard to determine things like Betelgeuse's diameter, its distance, and even whether any given dip in its brightness is really due to the star pulsating, or if maybe there's a cloud of foreground dust or a sunspot that's forming. Most measurements place Betelgeuse somewhere between 500 to 700 light years away, with a physical radius between 600 and 800 times the sun's. That means if it were placed where the sun is now, Betelgeuse's surface would extend well into the asteroid belt. That's big, but that's not thought to be large enough to suggest it's burning carbon. And that's why most astronomers think Betelgeuse is still burning helium and shouldn't supernova for another 100,000 years. So why do Sayo and his team think Betelgeuse is really fusing carbon and therefore could supernova within our lifetimes? And what exactly is so controversial about that? We're going to talk about that in a moment, but if you would like to learn more about Betelgeuse, there's a great documentary I recommend checking out on CuriosityStream, the sponsors of today's video.
Beetlejuice is the supernova next door waiting to happen. And this documentary describes its history, how one side of the star erupted, and whether or not its supernova will pose a threat to Earth. This documentary is just one of thousands of award-winning and original films, shows, and series by some of the world's best filmmakers. With plans starting at under $5 a month, you'll have access to thousands of hours of high-quality documentaries and series. If you love learning about science, technology, nature, or history, then I invite you to visit curiositystream.com forward slash LPA or scan this QR code and use the promo code LPA at checkout to save 25% off your subscription. Thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring today's video. Sayo's team modeled Betelgeuse's interior based off measurements of the star's four pulsation cycles that range from 2200 down to 185 days. Typically, the shorter periods key off the longest period, which is called the fundamental. So the short periods oscillate much like overtones over a bass frequency. Sayo takes the 2200-day cycle as Betelgeuse's fundamental period. Now that might seem obvious, but many astronomers believe that the 2200-day cycle isn't an actual pulsation period of the star. Rather, they think the 2200-day cycle must be due to some other cyclic phenomena generally referred to as a long secondary period. The most common example of an LSP is when the pulsating star is part of an eclipsing binary system. Other examples are the periodic buildup of large star spots on the red giant surface, or even orbiting clouds of dust. But Sayo's team took the 2200-day period as Betelgeuse's fundamental cycle. They modeled the star to find the best fit to all four pulsation periods, as well as its observed temperature and luminosity, and from there figured out what the core has to be doing. We can visualize these models on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which plots stars increasing luminosity versus decreasing surface temperature. Betelgeuse is here as a very cool yet luminous M-type red supergiant. About 10 million years ago, it was a smaller, hotter, O-type main sequence star with an initial mass of around 20 solar masses. But as the star evolved, it zigzagged across the HR diagram as it exhausted one source of fuel and ignited another. Exactly what path Betelgeuse actually took depends on a number of factors, like its rotation, the abundance of heavy elements in its core, and so on. But the most fundamental factor is the star's starting mass. The greater the mass, the hotter the core, and the faster it evolves. So, Sayo's team modeled evolutionary tracks for stars with different initial masses. The green tips at the end of the track start at the end of helium burning and continue through the end of carbon burning. Stars rotate, but they can't rotate too fast or else they rip themselves apart. This fly-apart velocity is called the star's critical rotation. The reason rotation is important is because it mixes more of the star's interior into the core. This increases the core's effective mass, which increases the star's overall luminosity. You can see the effect of rotation here in these additional models of a 19 solar mass star that started out rotating at 20% and 10% of its critical rotation. All of the models under 20 solar masses fuse carbon within Betelgeuse's error bars. The models also seem to fit the observed brightness variations in all four of Betelgeuse's pulsation periods as well. Sayo's team found that the overall best fits were that of a star that started out with a mass of 19 solar mass, initially rotating at either 20% or 40% of its critical velocity, and is now fusing carbon in the core. So if Betelgeuse is really fusing carbon, how long will it be before it goes boom? Well, the team modeled this as well. This is a plot of how the abundance of elements in the core change as it gets closer to going supernova. The vertical axis is the mass fraction of any given element in the core, and the horizontal axis is the logarithm of the number of years left. So the 5 is 10 to the 5 or 100,000 years out, 0 is the 1 year mark, and the negative 5 is 0 0.00005 year or about 5 minutes and 16 seconds before core collapse. The star starts off with a core of almost entirely hydrogen and helium with trace amounts of heavier elements. As it fuses hydrogen, the amount of helium increases. Starting at around a million years out, the amount of helium decreases as it begins fusing into carbon. 
at 100,000 years out, the remaining helium rapidly depletes, and carbon produces more and more oxygen, which in turn fuses to create neon. And notice that there's quite a bit of overlap here. These elements don't actually fuse sequentially, but as the lighter elements are depleted and the heavier elements fuse, the time scales get shorter and shorter. So let's say 100,000 years for helium, hundreds of years for carbon, and so on until about a day for silicon. Iron implodes so quickly that it's not even plotted on this graph. Anyway, notice how the abundance of carbon builds up and then drops off in a series of steps until it gets down to about the one-year mark. If Sayo's models are correct, and Betelgeuse is really in its carbon-burning phase, then the amount of carbon presently in the core should give us an idea as to how much time the star has left. The best-fitting models are listed here. They show that Betelgeuse could have as much as 17% of its core mass in the form of carbon, but it could also have as little as 0.67% carbon. And that could mean that the carbon is still just starting to build up in the core, and if that's the case, then sure, it would be the better part of 100,000 years before going supernova. But Sayo seems to argue that based on Betelgeuse's observed characteristics, it's probably closer to the end of its carbon burning phase. If it's at 17%, we're talking centuries. If it's at 0.67%, we're talking any decade now. So there you go. Betelgeuse is fusing carbon and getting ready to check out in style, right? Well, no, not according to the rebuttal published by Monar, Joyce, and Loon. Their main objection is that Sayo's model makes Betelgeuse too giant. Sayo's models assume that Betelgeuse's 2200-day period is a real physical pulsation of the star. But if that's true, then Betelgeuse would have to be much larger, somewhere on the order of 1300 solar radii. At Betelgeuse's distance, a star that big should have an angular diameter of about 55 milli arc seconds on the sky. To that end, Sayo's paper does quote several measurements that yield a similar angular size and therefore radii between 1,000 and 1,500 suns. The problem is that those measurements were made in the mid-infrared at a wavelength of 11 microns. Stars aren't solid objects, and different wavelengths penetrate down to different depths. Ideally, visible light measurements would reveal the star's photosphere, and you could directly measure its size. But Betelgeuse is surrounded by foreground dust. That dust could make Betelgeuse appear too small because it would dim the edges of the star that much more. That's why Betelgeuse's size is typically measured in the near-infrared K-band at 2.19 microns. That slightly longer wavelength is enough to penetrate most of the dust and reveal the star. K-band measurements place Betelgeuse's diameter at less than 45 milli arc seconds. That's at least 10 milli arc seconds smaller than the measurements quoted by Sayo. That means that even at the largest distance estimate of 880 light years, Betelgeuse would still be much less than 1300 solar radii, too small to have the star pulsating every 2200 days. Therefore, the 2200 day cycle must be a secondary period. Maybe it's the cycle of dark spots forming in the photosphere or the formulation of dust, or maybe something else that just isn't a true pulsation of the star. The smaller Betelgeuse still has a hot core, but just not hot enough to fuse carbon. Hence, it must be fusing helium, in which case we're back to 100,000 years to go. But Sayo isn't the only one who thinks the 2200-day period is real. Others cite changes in Betelgeuse's radial velocity over a similar period. And that suggests it really is growing larger and expanding, and then smaller as it contracts over time. As for Sayo's model not taking dust into account, is that really a problem? For instance, the critics argue that Betelgeuse's great dimming was caused by the star ejecting a large cloud of dust. But others aren't so sure. For example, in 2020, Thavisha Dharma Wardana and collaborators showed that Betelgeuse dimmed by a similar amount in the microwave spectrum as well. Microwave penetrates dust, so any drop-off in brightness must have been due to the star really dimming, no dust required. Now, to be clear, Betelgeuse does have a lot of dust surrounding it. We can see it, after all. But maybe Sayo's models really just don't need dust in order to work. And there's something else that I don't think either party fully addresses. Betelgeuse rotates at 6.5 kilometers per second at its equator. 
that's really fast for a supergiant. So where did all that extra angular momentum come from? Well, no one knows for sure, but the best hypothesis is that Betelgeuse may have once had a binary companion and swallowed it. The companion's angular momentum would have been added to Betelgeuse, making it spin up faster. How would that affect Betelgeuse's evolution? I don't know, but as far as I can understand, it hasn't really been fully addressed either. All of this is to say that even though Betelgeuse is the closest and best studied supernova progenitor, the star is a lot stranger than we thought, and we still have a lot more to learn about it. As for Sio, well, I don't know if he's right or not. As of this filming, his paper hasn't been published yet. But if Betelgeuse were to go supernova while I'm looking at it, I'd be inclined to give Sio the nod. A huge thanks as always to my Patreon supporters for helping to keep this channel going. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to learn more about Betelgeuse and its great dimming, I have some videos about that that I invite you to check out when we're done here. Until next time, stay curious, my friend.